Okay, opening exercise. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Dominique Bernardo. I'm the Vice President of Quality Assurance at Congreso de Latinos Unidos, which is a multi-service organization located in North Philadelphia. Quickly, a little bit about Congreso. I've worked there 10 years. Congreso is a 35-year-old agency. It's a multi-service organization that um, is the 14th largest Latino organization, nonprofit in the country. It, uh, we serve 15, 1, 5, 15,000 unique clients annually. We have a budget of about $23 million, which includes a charter school we founded. We have about 200 staff and 51 distinct programs. Congress's vision is for clients to reach economic self-sufficiency through education, employment, health, and supportive services. So, my name is Juan Angulo, I'm the director of data evaluation for Congresso, and my job there is to be a ETO administrator as well as help with evaluation efforts at Congresso. I'm Wendy McClanahan with a microphone. I'm from Public Private Ventures, and um, I have, I'm the senior vice president for research and evaluation there. I have been at PPV for a long time. And a little bit about PPV, um, we, our mission is to actually uh, partner with practitioners to improve uh, programming for young people from high poverty communities to help them successfully transition to adulthood. And we really, our goal really is to help improve programs. And so I'm here today um, with, uh, uh, with that perspective. So today we'll be presenting our material in a zoom in and zoom out format. So Wendy will be zooming out and presenting the big picture concept. Juan and I will then zoom in with some examples from Congresso. And then after each example, we're going to spend a couple minutes in an interactive discussion uh, with some structured questions we have. Uh, you should each have them at your, at your, um, at your station, I forgot to say. <laughs> Here's the next one. Okay, great. So um, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we want to do today is set the stage for the conversation. And um, just a little bit of background. Um, you know, 35 years ago, um, when PPV was founded, the, the social sector was rich with very innovative models. It was really growing at that point. But it was a lot of starvation for hard evidence about what works and what doesn't work and under what circumstances does it work. Um, at that time when PPV was founded, there were virtually no organizations that could really help answer those questions. And there was very little consensus about how um, to, uh, to, to evaluate programs, to learn how they work and under what circumstances they work best. But as a lot has changed over those 35 years, and today there's a whole industry that stands willing and ready to evaluate programs, whether they're old, new, faltering, strong, doesn't make a difference. There's a whole industry that's in place. Um, and funders, both public and private, stand ready to support those programs that are effective. Um, yet, at this point in time, despite all of those things being in place, um, funders and sometimes programs themselves, and sometimes evaluators still are asking the wrong questions. Um, and they're asking for the wrong kind of evidence, often, not always, at the wrong time for the wrong kinds of programs. So right now, there's, cons as all of you know, engaged in, in programming, there's a lot of interest in proving that your program is effective. Um, effective programs um, uh, are ones that um, are getting a lot of attention, are getting a lot of funding, et cetera, um, and that your funders increasingly are asking for evidence of your effectiveness. And so effectiveness equals funding. Um, and so at a minimum, funders are asking for information about what outcomes you're achieving, but more frequently, particularly in this uh, current funding environment, um, that, that funders are asking programs to supply information um, about their, their, th whether they work. Are you causing impacts for participants, yes or no? And those, those, if you can answer that question, you're more likely to get significant funding for uh, replication and expansion, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but there's a problem, and the problem, as probably many of you know, is that not all programs can actually undergo or should undergo this kind of rigorous um, uh, study, like a random assignment study, for example. Um, there are programs that are too small to do this. This is the tale of woe that we're talking about. This is what's required. Not all programs should do it. Um, some programs are too small. Programs that are early in their development should not be undergoing a really rigorous kind of impact study. Um, programs that don't have at least preliminary evidence that they're achieving outcomes shouldn't be doing this kind of study. Um, the kind of study, again, that funders are, are looking for to say, yes, you're, you're, really, you're really prepared to expand. Programs that serve all of the eligible participants, programs that have other kinds of questions they need to answer, like how do we best recruit people? That's not a question that should be answered with a rigorous impact study. In other cases, it might not be impossible to do an impact study, but it certainly is impractical. So there's programs, and some of you might be those kinds of programs that strive to actually have quote unquote contamination effects. So you serve a small number of kids in a school, but you actually hope to change the entire school. Makes it very difficult to do a rigorous impact study there. And programs who just have funders who are like, we're not doing that kind of, uh, you know, maybe a public funder, for example, who says, we're not going to do that kind of study. Um, but, but there's hope, um, and we're here to talk today about an alternative um, to how you can begin, if you can't do this kind of study, to show that you are, um, you're an effective program. Um, so for, I wanted to just give a quick example of, of this kind of um, situation. The Boys and Girls Clubs of America, many of you know them, they're quite large. They do a lot of impact studies and other kinds of studies of their programs. And they do some impact studies of like particular programs that they have, that they, that they do. I'm thinking of, for example, gang prevention through targeted outreach. Um, but what they can't do is do an impact study. They cannot randomly assign kids to come to the club or not come to the club. So over the course of the uh, 2000s, PPV engaged in an evaluation with them that really focused on trying to answer the question of whether they were effective or not, and did this through looking at how kids' participation was related to their outcomes. So there, and, and this kind of study did help Boys and Girls Clubs really um, understand how it was working and make the case to their funders that it was something that was important to exist. So, so, I, so, so it does work. So how are programs supposed to do this? And um, you know, some of the upsides of where we are currently in the, in the funding environment is that the growth of the social um, evaluation and social policy has, means we know a lot more than we did 35 years ago about what works and what doesn't. And we know a lot about who the populations are that we want to serve and what causes particular um, barriers. For example, what are some of the reasons why kids might drop out of school? Um, and we know that funders have to that recognize that it, you know, collecting information is important. So what programs can do that can't undergo this kind of evaluation but really need to show their funders that they are effective is that they can really focus on high quality program implementation. And here's why we think this is important. This is what we're going to talk about today. First is high quality program implementation. High quality programs leads to good outcomes. Um, secondly, a focus on High quality implementation is important both for programs that have an impact study and those that don't. So if you already have that impact study and you're trying to get bigger, you still need to really focus on quality program implementation. It's really important. Um, everyone needs and can do this kind of work. Uh, it is hard, and we're going to talk a little bit about why it's hard today. I think some of our examples will show that too. But it's definitely doable. It takes time and commitment and resources and should take the same kind, should have the same kind of commitment as the actual programming itself. Um, but we do recognize that it's hard to find resources to do this kind of work. And I think that some of the examples today will provide some really concrete ideas of how you can move forward with this. Um, the, another reason for really focusing on uh, program quality is because it's um, important, like I said, for programs that are starting out as well as those are scaling. For example, there's a, a program in Philadelphia that has been um, working on uh, high quality programming from its inception very early on when it spent a lot of time looking at both qualitatively, like through interviews and talking with participants and staff, what was working and what wasn't. Also developed a data collection system to begin to try and understand what was going on um, in the program and then made tweaks along the way. That's what they did very early on. And then as they replicated and scaled within Philadelphia, they um, continued this kind of research to really understand what was working and what wasn't. And um, 
focusing on high quality program implementation also provides critical information for funders and demonstrates capacity. And the, why, the example I just gave of this uh, organization in Philadelphia, the work that they did really led funders um, to uh, engage with them more than they had before because they, they knew what was going on in their program. They were able to strengthen it and make mid-course corrections. So um, we're going to talk about program quality today, high quality <laughs> programming and implementation. And this is what we mean by high quality program implementation. We're focusing on these kind of three macro areas. We recognize there is a lot that goes into high quality programming. And there are a lot more things than this, um, but a lot of them are at more of the micro level. This is kind of the, you know, 30,000 feet uh, level. So the first is to adopt a focus and intentional programmatic strategy. The second is to implement that strategy with fidelity and measure it well. And the third is to invest in and focus on continuous program improvement efforts. Um, so there's also significant overlap in these three areas. It's kind of a recursive process. And as we talk through um, these uh, areas and our examples today and discuss it with you, you'll see that it's not quite <laughs> as straightforward as these three uh, buckets, but, but that this is, this is where we want to start. Okay, so our first area that we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk, as Dominique said, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes at this kind of high 30,000 foot level. And then uh, Dominique and Juan are going to give examples from their work at Congresso. So the first, er the first area that we want to talk about in terms of program quality is focused and intentional programmatic strategy. And what we mean by this is that in order for programs to be uh, high quality and effective, they need to have a clear set of goals. I I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard this before. A clear set of goals, they need to target specific skills, and deliberately plan all aspects of the program with a specific kind of ideally research-based or research-informed framework in mind. Um, there's a couple different ways of doing this. It can be provided by kind of unilaterally adopting an evidence-based practice, so something that's already been proven. Or you could generate an evidence-informed uh, model, especially if you're, you're being innovative and trying to solve a community problem that, or trying to um, come up with a, a new strategy for, uh, for addressing um, barriers that uh, kids or individuals may uh, face. <clears throat> um, most programs can achieve this by um, clearly articulating a theory of change or a logic model, and I think David Hunter's hiding back there, but um, he is going to talk about this a little bit more in the second um, session of this series, and he'll provide more details about how and why to do this well. Um, the, it, as part of your theory of change or your logic model or your documentation process, it's really important to um, document the inputs, so the program strategy, and this includes the target population, the duration, et cetera, and they're linked to each other and to the outcomes you're trying to um, achieve need to be explored and they need to be challenged um, as part of this, you know, developing a focused and intentional programmatic strategy. Similar the out, similarly, the outcomes you're trying to achieve, um, your in-program outcomes, your short-term program outcomes, and your long-term program outcomes um, need to be made explicit and really need to be realistic. And this is part, I think, of where the challenge comes in to really think about if you're doing something, is it going to lead to something else? So for instance, and Congresso is going to talk about this, there are light touch programs that you may do um, that can uh, achieve very straightforward goals and are valuable, but, but they might not have very, very robust impacts. Um, so in order to have really robust outcomes for the participants, you either need to link that light touch program with something else, or you actually need to make it bigger. Um, and like I said, Congresso will give an example of this. Target population is also another really critical um, piece here. For instance, this sounds so straightforward, but I, we've seen it a lot, and I think you guys have probably struggled with it too. But if you are trying to, for example, increase college attendance among youth from, from high poverty communities, you need to make sure you're actually targeting kids who wouldn't go to college otherwise. And it sounds really straightforward, but it's not. So who are those kids? How do you figure it out? Because otherwise, you're not going to, you might achieve the outcome, but you're not going to have any impacts. Um, 
so in addition to documenting this theory of change, logic model, your process, it's really important to put in place processes for making sure that that model is put into place. And Congress is going to talk a little bit about that. And the final thing I'll say at the 30,000 foot level is don't be lured by funding drift. Because if you are um, telling a funder that you're going to achieve outcomes that you really can't achieve, you're not going to achieve them and you will not be effective. So I think that pretty much goes without, without saying, but I wanted to say it anyway. We're going to zoom in on a Congresso example um, where we actually created a model and documented it ourselves. So uh, in 2007, Congresso went through a theory of change process with actually David Hunter. And just out of curiosity, how many folks have actually gone through a theory of change process with your organization? Okay, great. So maybe close to half. With David Hunter? <laughs> okay. I'm just priming you. Okay. So uh, during this theory of change process, Congresso committed to three things, among many others. For those of you that have been through it, you're aware of that. First is we committed to a standard set of agency outcomes. And um, that we could do a whole presentation uh, in itself on that. And uh, I'm not going to go into that, but we focused on areas of uh, education, achievement, employment, and health and supportive services. Secondly, we committed to a target population. Our target population was 8 to 35-year-olds. And uh, we, based, we based the, the youth part, the fact that we wanted to focus on youth, on research that showed that intervening for youth at critical junctures could help get them back on the path to economic achievement and eventually lead to a productive adulthood. And we tagged on the, um, like the 25 to 35 year olds, because Congress, we felt really strongly, and, there's, and also based on research, as we were talking with Wendy as well, that the parental influence is so significant in the lives of youth. And so we, we felt it was really important to include that parental piece as well. And the third thing that we committed to, among others, was we committed to delivering services in a more integrated way, a more integrated holistic way. And so in committing to that, we recognized, and we, we kind of knew this, but we had never named it out loud, that we weren't delivering our case management services in a consistent way. And we were providing case management services across a diverse range of programming. So we have HIV case management, we have behavioral health case management, we have family stabilization services that provide case management, youth development, et cetera, et cetera. We had anywhere from maybe 65 to 75 case managers in the agency. So we worked with a consultant to do a national search to say, let's go out and find a model for integrated case management that works. And guess what? There wasn't one. At least we didn't find one. So if you know one, tell me. So we created our own. And that has been a long journey for us for the past four and a half years. We've spent this time creating and refining, we're on version 2.0 currently, a case management model which we have named PCM, the Primary Client Management Model. PCM will refer to it for the rest of the presentation. And this is our example of a focused and intentional programmatic strategy. And there's a few key parts of that strategy I want to highlight for you. First is the outcomes, of course. And uh, we focus on um, educational achievement, this is all going to sound familiar to you, employment achievement, and barrier removal. So when case managers have meaningful contacts with clients, they're reflecting on those values and saying, where is this client? on these three outcome scales. We created a comprehensive system for tracking those outcomes, for tracking client progress in those areas, and we also included a comprehensive manual uh, for doing that in ETO. Second part, separate from outcomes, number two, process. So we created assessments. We created an essential assessment. We created a referral system, because we hadn't really documented how you do referrals within our 51 programs, let alone externally created a discharge checklist that came on a little later. We now have something called a progress check that we rolled out this past year. We created timelines, guidelines, electronic tools, all for the case managers to ensure that they were implementing this model in a consistent way. We actually created something called a PCM implementation team. And so when the consultant pulled out, after we had done our theory of change, we created a business plan, we were defining this model, we created this team to keep the work going. So it's a vertically integrated team of case managers through vice presidents, still meets today on a monthly basis, four and a half years later. And this team um, is sort of um, kicking the tires around the model on a regular basis. What's working, what's not working. They've helped refine it on a regular basis. We have some subcommittees that are working on everything from um, this new progress check we created to um, maybe um, hosting some uh, focus groups around how things are going. And we actually have a protocol document as well, which started way back when, when I had said, maybe I should start writing down some of the things we're deciding around this model so we kind of can keep track of it. And this Microsoft Word document, very simple, kind of grew and grew and grew, 
but it's now sort of, it's our roadmap because it's got the history behind it, behind the model, the philosophy, and then the guidelines that we've created. And this, this document, which we have to continue to update, becomes the, the, the roadmap for the strategy. And it's something that we use in training. It's something that you know, case managers and their supervisors uh, refer to on a regular basis. Well, parts of it, some of it's too long. And the third uh, piece, we talked about outcomes, talked about process. The third piece I wanted to highlight in our strategy was the trainings. And we actually created a formal agency training. It started out as five days, and now it's down to two and a half to train folks, both supervisors and client managers, on this model. And uh, really to ensure that everyone was on board. So there have been challenges for sure in rolling out this model. And one of them that I want to highlight for you has to do with uh, supervisors um, uh, embracing this model. So when we launched it, uh, we kept saying, we've got to get supervisors involved, we've got to get supervisors involved. And you know, we, at the end, we kind of people were busy. We said, well, why don't we give them an abbreviated training? And it came after the fact that the line staff were trained. So we have this group of client managers out there, some who are embracing it, some who weren't, um, you know, kind of eager to talk about this and use this. And they were expected to use this model, expected to get into ETO and be documenting their outcomes. And we've got supervisors that were kind of like, you know, some of them, I don't know what you're talking about. And so we had to take a step back. And we kind of um, retraced our steps, trained the supervisors, tried to roll things out, and it was a little tricky. So um, two years later, when we rolled out, two and a half years later, version 2.0 of our model, we actually did it a little differently. We involved the supervisors intimately um, in the new model. We actually presented to them some of the things that the team came up with and said, what do you think about this? Tested it with them. They were trained first. And they also had specific messages they had to give to the staff who had to go back and get retrained, or if they were new, trained for the first time, talking about the model. So we were really intentional this time about you know, recognizing that the supervisors had to buy into this, and because they were the ones that were expected to carry it out long term. So our model is constantly evolving, but we're really careful to implement change at a systematic level. And that's some, the, the last thing I just wanted to mention. So we first rolled it out, you know, we found some little glitches and bugs. We're like, oh, let's change this. Here's an email. Now do this differently. And finally, some staff came to us and said, could you just maybe do them quarterly? Just maybe roll out these changes quarterly or something different so it's not all the time. So we started implementing um, quarterly updates, which then evolved into finally a whole new version 2.0. So, um, Juan is briefly going to touch base with another Congresso example before we get into some discussion questions. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, dosage and how we're saying uh, part of the planning a programmatic strategy is making sure that the service you're providing, uh, the context that you're providing, are really going to yield to the outcomes that you're expecting. Um, but not always will that be feasible because either funding is limited or sometimes because you might be more effective by specializing in a specific area and then collaborating with other programs in order to achieve the long-term outcomes. And so that's the example I'm going to show, which is uh, a Congress that we have an HIV testing program. The objective is for them, they go, they're looking for clients that might be at risk of contracting HIV. They go to the streets, to high-risk zones. They provide testing on the spot, and, re and they get the, res the results right there on the spot, as well as they provide um, case management or counseling on how to safe, safe sex methods too for HIV prevention. Um, in this picture here, they're actually, they're facilitating a fair at a local park where there's a high drug traffic use. And they actually tested uh, 60 people, of which one of them ended up, what they identified that was HIV positive. On an annual basis, they, have, they do 1,500 screenings. So in the case where they actually identify somebody that's HIV positive, what they do is they'll quickly connect them to a whole network of services that's available to them, one of them being HIV care. HIV care is a case management program. It's a long-term program. It can be multiple years. They just walk, walk along with the clients. And the goal of them is, is basically provide case management, uh, which includes home visits, care coordination, as well as education and HIV and, how dis and disease management. So now, by this type of networking collaboration, what HIV testing has been able to do is actually very successfully do a lot of screenings in the community, and at the same time making sure that people that are HIV positive have the support and the follow-up that it's adequate for them. And so this is an example of how there is internal collaboration in Congress, so within two programs, but this type of collaboration should be happening at all levels too, um, even with external, such as an after-school program with a school, 
and case management programs so that we're all strategizing our efforts to our common goals and objectives. So, so we're going to pause for a moment because we really think it's important that you reflect on this material in your own organization and hopefully to take these questions back to your organization and have some rich conversation there. So if you look at the um, structured discussion questions we have provided for you, there's a lot of them. You're a little ambitious. We could probably spend a little time talking about one of them. Um, if, you could, if you could briefly look at them for a minute yourself, and then we'd like you to do something. And then we'd like you to actually turn to you know two or three, maybe groups of two or three. You don't have to get out, obviously, if you're too tight in here. And um, just share, maybe, uh, whatever you have time, if it's just one person that shares in the group, uh, your own experience with one of these questions. And we're just going to ask for a couple of volunteers to share it with a larger group. Okay? So we only have about three, three four minutes. Okay. Volunteer if somebody'd like to share one of the samples from their organization, and it can be obviously any of the questions. Or something they heard, you heard something from someone else that you had really struck you. Could you share that? Um, I, you know, I, again, we're a funder, so it's a little different, you know, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. It's a little broader, so. Um, but. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that is, boy, you man, you really know how to drill down. You know, it, we left nothing up for guessing. We have four sets of outcomes for our, outcomes for our grantees. We believe that a stronger organization, a nonprofit organization, is going to help us get to our outcomes. And so we have three participant outcomes. And we define in those three participant outcomes what those indicators are. And we've gone so far as to tell them exactly what. Um, instrument to use to measure those outcomes. We don't want to leave anything up. Yes. Now, if a grantee comes and says, "Hey, we've got this um, uh, indicator and in this measurement tool, and it's standardized and it's normed for the population," we are like, "Oh, great. Okay, that makes sense. It's not a problem." But again, if you have to prepare for the um, population and just the level of sophistication that an organization might be at. Um, and you may need that service, and you, you know, we want to help organizations succeed um, as long as they're willing and able. Uh, and then we have community wide outcomes. We want the taxpayers to feel some relief as a result of this, and we want uh, better lives for our kids. And then lastly, we have aggregated outcomes, and we will know we're successful as funders when we do have indeed um, organizations that are stronger, the service gap is decreased, and kids have better positive outcomes. I know, and I just briefly, I congrats to we work as a consultant to look at the tools, the way we were measuring our indicators, and we really wanted to use that in space tools. And where there wasn't one, we did use in some cases homegrown tests that were really um, worked on the you know, RD and research back, you know, evaluation backgrounds, made sure this is the way you have to do it. We did have staff measuring different indicators in different programs, different ways, right? Same indicators in different programs. So what else? What else resonated with you or Thank you. <laughs> hey, I asked my colleagues here, uh, what about implementation? Uh, do you have a theory of change? Do you have a bunch of models? And uh, as, as we were talking about, that's theoretically all very nice. You have a great looking document, but can you actually do that now? And one of the suggestions is to use a ball bridge process. And uh, so I can, personally, I'm intrigued by that, so I'm going to keep research. So. Great. Um, okay, so this is uh, the tenant number two of high quality programming. 
is that once you have um, the uh, focused and intentional programmatic strategy, you need to implement that strategy with fidelity and measure, measure, measure. Lots of measuring. Do lots of data collection. Um, you need to measure well. So um, once you have the program model documented, the right things, quote unquote, are in place, um, you know, if you implement it with fidelity, you can be confident, if it works, that you're going to get the outcomes that you seek. So the question then becomes, how will you know if you're implementing with fidelity um, and achieving your outcomes? And that is, uh, the answer to that is threefold. The first is uh, through process. Um, so I think uh, Dominique shared a little bit about the processes she put in place at Congresso. Um, second is through training, so making sure that the knowledge of that, um, of that model is really at all levels of the organization. And finally, putting in place a robust measurement strategy to be sure that the things that you think you're doing, you're actually doing. Um, you know, this all seems pretty straightforward, but uh, I think a lot of programs struggle with it. It's really hard to do and to do well, and it, it takes time away from um, you know, delivering service, for example. Um, uh, and so capacity becomes an issue in, in really, particularly around the measurement um, and the documentation piece. Um, it's important to recognize that the measurement around uh, implementing with fidelity is different from case management. Um, in that uh, the goal of measuring the program's implementation really is one to look at the aggregate information. And as, as an evaluator, and, and you all might have experienced this as well, um, that when you speak with people about what's happening and what's not happening, people are actually really good at remembering what is happening, but not so good at remembering what's not happening. So not, not for any bad reason. I think it's just human nature. So you, know, you might ask people, well, how often are you seeing your caseload? And the case manager might see, oh, I, I say, oh, I see them eight times a month, but they're forgetting in that calculation, like you know, the five percent of people who they really can't even connect with. So it's important to have this aggregate information versus just the case management information, which is important for other reasons. Um, and uh, the the next thing is that the data and the measurement really needs to be high quality, and this is also something that takes time and effort. Um, to make sure that it's done well. So um, we have a very sophisticated um, saying at PPV that crap in equals crap out. So if you don't have good data to begin with, you're not going to actually know what's happening in your program. Um, and it's finally really important to measure all of the components of your, um, of your theory of uh, change or your logic model. So overall, the strategy to do this is going to require the organizational capacity to make the data accessible, accessible useful, and relevant. And you know, programs like uh, Social Solutions exist to help, help with that. Um, you're going to need to have a data-driven um, and learning organizational culture, one that's not punitive, so people are able to look at their performance and the performance of, their, um, of the participants that they work with and look at that as a way of learning and doing better and not necessarily you're not doing your job, et cetera. Third is process, process, process. You need to have processes in place um, for documentation, for training, and for uh, data utilization at all levels of the organization. And finally, all staff buy-in uh, is really important um, for uh, implementing with fidelity and measuring well. So that's the zoom out. Now Dominique's going to zoom in. Okay, so we're going to zoom in on a Congresso example to illustrate uh, this step of implementing with fidelity and measuring it well. Okay, so we introduced to you our primary client management model, PCM model, uh, the case management model we created. So we spent the first two to three years for really focusing on the outcomes and the data procedures. Um, but we realized then that we needed a way of ensuring that the case managers were delivering the services consistently and applying the model with fidelity so we could see if our hypothesis was correct that this model would lead to our education and employment outcomes. And, but what was happening is we were really too data focused. I know that might sound crazy to some of you. Or, um, but, so we needed to really zoom in on how client interactions, on how the interactions were happening post-training. You know, do they get it and are they following through with it? 
And um, our, our, we were lucky to have a dedicated person to training uh, at Congresso. And you know, his, his mantra is training is not a one-time event. And so it's not like go in and train them and just have them go do their job, the case managers. We're very careful, especially because of those ch lessons learned, to involve supervisors because they're the ones that are accountable really to making sure this model is happening with fidelity. So I'm going to talk briefly. We created something called a quality check. It's a case manager quality check. And it's a supervisor tool to monitor fidelity to the model. So uh, with the intention that supervisors play a more active role in the model. So what it is, um, how it works is uh, immediately after a uh, case manager goes through the agency training on the model, the supervisor conducts this check. And then every six months thereafter, they conduct this check. And there's four parts to the check. We have, we have guidelines, and it's actually a checklist. There are four parts, uh, knowledge test review, observation, case note review, and ongoing discussion. So the first part, knowledge test review. Uh, we actually had developed a knowledge test based on the content of the PCM training that the uh, staff take when they finish the training. Uh, and the supervisors, as part of this check, will actually review the answers to the test with individually with their supervisees uh, and look you know, specifically for answers that were um, not answered correctly. And they can reinforce that material individually with that staff because it might be an area that they didn't quite get in the group training. So that's the first part, knowledge test review. Secondly, observation. The supervisor is expected to actually go and observe a client interaction with the case manager, that the case manager has with the client. And uh, they're looking for how well the case manager demonstrates an understanding and application of the model. So for example, they're going to look for some of the skills and tasks we teach. So they're going to look for um, open-ended questions, or is the case manager using reflective listening qu statements, because those are some of the things we teach in our model. So that's observation. Thirdly, case note review. The supervisor is going to review case notes to look for evidence of our model. So they're going to look for evidence. Um, we use an influential client management approach is what we call it. So they're going to look for um, evidence that the case manager negotiated an agenda or that they asked for commitment of the client. So they're going to look for written evidence of the, uh, of the model itself. And lastly, ongoing discussion. The case manager is expected to role play at times, uh, client interaction with the case manager, and once again, look for evidence of, of application of the model. Now, those are the four parts to the checklist. We do very little data entry in ETO around this checklist. The uh, supervisors actually just document that they did it and what the date was so that we're able to, we track, uh, Juan's team tracks that it happened. We were looking for 100% participation, which we've gotten. Um, but we've, you know, we've realized and learned over the years that everything doesn't have to be tracked in ETO. So that's why we kept it really simple. And the, the meat of this tool is really around the discussion, the hearty discussion that the supervisor has with the supervisee. So that's one example of Congresso's um, attempts to implement with Fidelity and measure it. So we're going to go back to discussion for a moment. If we can, um, you can look at your uh, discussion questions. Um, Pause for a moment, think about um, any of these questions, how they relate to you or your work. And then if once again you could turn to someone at your side and have a two to three minute discussion, uh, that would be great. Great, thank you. I think with the organization that I work for, um, I think where we struggle is we've got elements of these things, but it's not ever viewed as this comprehensive kind of package. We do this orientation, you know, when our staff come in. We do a pretty good job of um, on the assessment side with um, connecting with our families and, and getting their feedback, or our preschool teachers are getting their feedback. Um, but it always seems a little bit <coughs> like we don't have this 
nice package that I can lay out and say, here's the process, here's all the pieces. It's just, just not in a nice, nice way, yeah. yet, in that respect. Yeah. Don't feel a little disjointed. Yeah. And, and if I can say, like, pulling that together and packaging it is, you know, is, also, is really also part of the leadership's job, right? Because they need to be selling that, talking about it. Like our board members know what PCM stands for. We report on it at every board meeting. Mm -hmm. But until we went through that whole process, we didn't, we were in the same situation. So yeah, it's so important. Anything else? Dominique? Yes. I just want to make a comment. Um, obviously, I think this is terrific work that you're doing. Um, but what it points to is that most funders' expectations about how quickly you can implement uh, performance management are, are delusional. <laughs> and, and they impose, uh, uh, through their grant making, expectations of rapid implementation on organizations that actually can destroy them. So, um, just for the, the sake of the room, I, my experience is with the, with, with the organizations I've worked with, this is a three to six year process. Yeah. And 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 then it's ongoing. The work is never ended with refining the implementation. But you get to a really um, a, a new level of implementation in three to six years. And I would just encourage everyone in this room: if a funder is trying to get you to do it faster, tell them no. <laughs> that you're not going to destroy your organization just to make them feel good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think that's great. I and mean, that kind of talks a little bit more about the progress check that we have um, or the quality check. When we implemented it, we're, we're using the PCM implementation team, and we're discussing what things should be reviewed. It included concepts that people said it's already happening. I mean, this course is like, I'm already seeing my case manager. I'm overseeing them. I'm reviewing the notes already. But what we figured out, and they, this is already two years, three years down the line after trying to PCM that we needed a formalized system. So even if we have a new supervisor, they can very quickly start on the ground. They have the standard format, and that all supervisors do the exact same review, making sure that the daily is happening the same way. So even though it was uh, just a, a few elements that we listed, we made sure that it was concise and clear for everybody to carry out. So, thanks for the comment. Anything else? Hi, I'm from NPEACE in Philadelphia, and we have implemented for our program something called the Learning Institute, in which we show our programs how to do this the program, um, the program quality, and we have an assessment, we have them do a program quality assessment. And so they'll come through the Learning Institute, which is six weeks, six week sessions, and just teach them everything that they need to know, basically about how to manage a program. And then we have um, something that we call study hall, which is, it goes on past the actual um, Learning Institute, so we can keep bringing them back after, their, after they went back and started to try and implement it, if they're having any challenges. So you stay with your same group and you come back to continue to um, to improve your quality of your program. And so with that, I'm not sure if any of you guys seen that, um, we just had a webinar on ETO for the Learning Institute because it definitely is working. It de it's working because it is a three to six year process. And in that process, things are going to evolve and change. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, that it's a very good program that we're running. And it definitely helps. We get a, good, a lot of feedback from it. Yeah. We actually, one of our youth development programs participated in the Learning Institute, mapped out their program, and had a really positive experience. So I think that webinar is available, right? Post, post yes, it's live. available online okay. on their website. Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sonia. All right, zoom it out. So this is a great segue to what we're going to talk about next, which is continuous program improvement. It takes a really, really long time to do all of these things, to document them, and then to begin to investigate to figure out what's working well and what's not working well and go back and make changes and tweaks maybe just to implementation and maybe actually to your entire model. So, um, and a lot of the examples we've talked about already today have that element in them. So the final, the final uh, component at the macro level of the high quality programming is around continuous program improvement. Um, and it is, the, the definition is strengthening program quality through an ongoing and integrated feedback process where data on fidelity and outcomes informs the implementation of the program and possibly the revision of the logic model and or the, the um, theory of change. So, um, 
when you are uh, measuring, and I, I thought Dominique's example of measurement and not focusing just on the quantitative, the numbers, 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 is really, really important. Um, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that, that the you know, quality of, of communications matters, that you know, there's more to it. But, so, but the measurement for, for this learning process really has um, kind of these four purposes. And the first um, is to, and this is how it differs from typical evaluation, is to bring new knowledge into daily practice versus a typical evaluation might be to discover new knowledge. That's not what the goal is here. It is to bring knowledge into daily practice. The test that you would do through this continuous program improvement is, is to do many sequential tests, like is this working, is it not working, let's change something, let's test it again, versus when you're doing an external evaluation or a different kind of question, you're really trying to answer one central question, one there's one large blind test, this is working or not. The data you need to gather enough to know about your model but in the evaluation world, if you're having an impact study, you're going to you're going to gather enough data to be safe. We always want to make sure that there's uh, that we're finding the outcomes. And finally, the duration is that you're going to do these kind of small tests of significant change. So you're going to keep measurement, but the tests, the questions you're answering, are going to be small and focused. That'll help you the questions you're asking, the data that you're looking at, to help you inform your stronger implementation of your model or revision of it. So some key considerations here around continuous program improvement is that you need to make sure um, that all staff are clear on the outcomes, goals, and definitions. And this, I can't remember whether we mentioned this before, but it is really, really important at all of these different levels of program quality that all levels of the staff in the organization or in the program are engaged in this process, that they buy into it and they understand it. Um, you need to connect the lines for some line staff so that they can really understand, okay, of this, what is the piece that I'm contributing to and how can I maximize my successful contribution? And I think we're going to talk about some examples of that next. Congresso is going to share some of their examples. Um, you want to try and encourage program staff to develop an inquisitive mind about the work. Um, and I think it, most of us have that, but thinking about it in terms of continuous program improvement is a little bit of a different, um, a little bit of a different hat to wear. So beginning, you know, as I, I'm trying to think of an example, but maybe my job is recruitment and beginning to really want to know what, what, what recruitment sources are, are the most effective and why, why or why not? Does that mean we need to do additional reach? outreach to ones that seem less effective or is it that that strategy really isn't going to work or similarly if you're a job placement program let me see if I can say this in a way that makes sense and you're um, you're serving both women and men and you're placing them in jobs in the construction industry and maybe you're serving a lot of women who have um, you know and you're finding that w you're having a harder time women women are having a harder time uh, staying in those jobs so your uh, retention numbers aren't that Good, you might need to you know, think about, well, why is that? Why does it look like that? And do some, and here's where the data might not actually <laughs> exactly inform. You might need to actually talk to participants. Women who, I know, I mean, but, but it is part of the data. So when I say measure, 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 these are part of the things that are important to do. It doesn't have to be just numbers. But talk to the participants, and, and this, we had this experience where the women who were in this program were actually w women who underwent a lot of abuse as young people, and guess what? They didn't want to work in construction industry because it was primarily male-dominated field. And so, so it wasn't just about doing a better job of providing retention services to those women. It was that that, that logic model needed to be changed. Women were not going to be served as well by this program. Or you needed to provide a lot of support to the women, perhaps, to uh, keep them engaged in, in construction careers. Um, and. Finally, I just said this to seek um, to seek customer feedback too. So, the way and the final thing you want to do is, as you make these tweaks to either your implementation or to your logic model, is that you're going to want to look at changes over time. And I think this is something we're going to uh, that Congresso is also going to uh, share how you can look at particular data points over time and see whether they're changing for positive or negative, and then begin to make some assumptions about how you might meet, need to make some changes. So continuous program improvement, there's probably a lot that can go into this. Um, 
But I'll just start by saying that we found that it's key that everybody in the agency has a role on monitoring and ensuring, the, um, reviewing the performance of the agency efforts. This includes staff, supervisors, executives, everybody needs to be looking at the data. Um, basically, that's what we're talking about is performance management. There's probably a whole bunch of uh, tips on how to promote performance management, but I'm just going to say two things that we have found that have been key is we need to have clear access to data, that it's formatted in a way that really facilitates integration of data to the services. So the facility. And the other one is be intentional on setting up the times and spaces in which data is going to be discussed and should be reflected. Um, so I can have many examples of how we do that, but just focusing on the PCM model that Dominic has been explaining, um, I can show you how we've been doing this at the different levels at the agency. So I'll start, um, at, for example, at the supervisor and the staff level. This is the advanced caseload report that we've put together for our PCM model. It's based on ETO results. Our reporting training coordinator ha uh, put this together. It pulls program history, contact dates, assessments, and all that's condensed into this. And there's two views to this screen. This is the summary view. So it give the aggregate, and then there's a detailed one that has the specific outcomes for each of the program, of the clients, and what's happening, what are the changes during that period. Um, so the supervisor and the case manager can pull this, which has the different case managers in the program, or they can just focus into one specific. Um, and they do this during, super, they may do it individually. The case manager will do it before planning what they're going to do for the week. The supervisor will do it to review what's happening with, this, with, uh, with all the program. And during supervision, they'll run this report together. They'll go through the caseload, see what's the caseload size, what's the number of contacts, when was the last contact happening. Uh, what assessments have been completed, what's the time frame of those assessments, what, how many risk factors were identified, how many of those are being engaged or being worked on, what's still pending. So that can, they can prioritize and plan what, what, how should they react, how should they strategize going forward. So this is happening regularly during supervision. And then on once, once a month, they, they get together and after reviewing the caseload, they determine what is the strength of their caseload. Um, so what we, what we did is we provided a, a rating, which is called the strength quotient. And all this does is really is assess what's the caseload. And together figured out, for example, how, what's the caseload size? How much time is spent with the clients? How many contacts are there with the clients? And what's the level of engagement with clients? Is it appropriate? The um, progress toward their goals is appropriate. And just basically through calculations, so we figured out what is the strength quotient for the caseload. And since this is happening monthly, what's happening is that then the, the staff are have creating a history of what, what their impact is. And at the same time, when they're doing this, they can strategize to see how can they change the rating for the next month. Once they have the history, this is uh, another ETO results report that would actually pull that data. What's the history of the strength quotient for, 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 the, for the case managers? This is two different case managers. And if I just drill into one specific, the top section is the, the history of the strength quotient during the past month, and the bottom of the bar chart is actually the caseload size. So it also brings a little bit of history to see how does the caseload really impact the strength quotient of, of the case manager as well. So they can review this as well as a way of integrating and reflecting to see how, what's happening. And so the discussion is not really being on what I think, how many contacts I had, but really it's how many contacts are there, what does the caseload really say. Um, my team has this mode of the saying that if if it's not in ETO, it didn't happen. Sorry, D. Yes. I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. If you back up two slides where you're putting those uh, numbers in, where do, where do you get those numbers, time spent in supervision? Uh, that's based on the initial caseload. So this caseload, basically, they'll review this caseload, identify what's the progress in the, in the goals, and what's the status, how much time, and if the context, if it's appropriate based on the complexity of the case. And then based on that, they'll assess if this has been appropriate or should, what should be our... Are they logging the minutes along the way? or are they, <laughs> they are logging the minutes. That's correct. And sorry, just that, that strength quotient is a nice way that we may label a rating or a grade, but we don't want to call it that. So it's a scale of 1 to 100 or 0 to 100 that the supervisee actually gets every time that they have the supervision. So they'll strength quotient 86 or 87. Mm -hmm. And we've been careful that, um, that they're actually only evaluating, evaluated against themselves so there are some schools of thought that say, slap those results up on the wall and show the world. We've, we've shied away from that for now. And we've really uh, had something between the supervisor and the supervisee to say really work to improve that, that, that grade, which measures the strength of the caseload. So, 
and I, and I would just add that that's, that even just calling it the strength quotient is a really good example of how you you you, you uh, foster this positive non-punitive climate. Um, yeah. One more question. Yeah. About the question. Mm -hmm. uh, do the numbers get pulled in from the existing data, or does it require any any? Uh, well, actually, it does require. And I think it, 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 there's been some surprises. Like, why doesn't the system automatically create the strength quotient of the caseload so I don't have to do data? But we actually, what we, one of the, the purpose of the, of, the, of the strength quotient, too, is to ensure that the supervisors are also playing an active role on reviewing the data and reviewing it. And even though they say it's happening, if it's not an ETO, it didn't happen. There's no way of really assessing. So it, a lot of those numbers are not subjective, are very specific. It has to match basically what's on the caseload report. The caseload report says this is the number of caseloads, this is how many contacts have happened, and so on, and that's assessment. Some of them are more subjective. For example, the part was like, are they, ac are they at an appropriate engagement level? depending on how long was the history, the complexity of the issue, how much progress they've done towards the goals, that's where the call needs to happen. And I guess uh, by having that combination, there's this reflection in the data and it's informing it. So that's the purpose. Yes? Do you, have you gotten to the point yet where you map the strength quotient report against the, um, against the aggregated progress of clients on this person's case management uh, caseload in achieving designated outcomes? We haven't done that, but that's actually a thought that we've had, and especially we have to figure out how to assess it since you can see the strength quotient vary significantly by month to month, and it could be for various reasons. For example, the client is not uh, engaged one month or drops out. Um, so we have to figure out what's the best strategy to do that, but that's kind of where we're going with this. That'll be our presentation next year. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is the interaction that happens at the supervisor and the case manager level. Um, uh, then, I guess, let me see. Uh, the next thing is uh, we have, the, where we, uh, we have used data is through our QA managers. Um, my data team is an independent team at Congressa, and there's four divisions that provide services. So this has been beneficial because we were able to create reports as an independent source and just say this is what it is, this is what ETO says, what's happened. Um, but at the same time, we realized that we needed an inside person as well that can implement this, can help us drive and dr d develop the culture. So what happens is they develop a quality assurance manager position, and it's a half-time role that the operational uh, directors play. So half time they're working operations, the other half they're looking really at, at the data and the implementation and the integration of the PCM model. So they'll do cross-sectional analysis, sometimes just going across how the supervisors are doing the, the supervision, what's, how is the case managers implementing it, just doing this random testings. At the same time, my team, the data team, will have monthly meetings where we'll actually pull in reports, what's the progress across the agency, breaking it out by, by programs, reviewing that PCM, is it more effective in some programs than others? Are, we, are there any challenges in implementation? And together with the, with the quality assurance team, we will uh, strategize to see what's needed. Training, supports, uh, or just reviewing or auditing. So that's the kind of stuff. So that's the quality assurance manager. Then the quality assurance managers also do on a, on a bi-monthly basis. They have an administrative meeting where they pull all the directors of the department and to assess what are the progress through the goals. Dominique talked about the PCM implementation team meeting, which is a cross-sectional meeting. Uh, that's happening on a monthly basis, where whenever we're well, at a six month time of, of the year, we'll probably run an, an aggregate outcomes report and analysis to see how do we compare this, this mid-year compared to the previous one, and, or design to see how, how should we be changing or moving forward. And then even at the board level, it's a reoccurring item on the agenda to review data. And we'll have PCM updates in the, for the board as well, as well as all the uh, objectives that we have for the agency. So in this way, just focusing on the PCM model, which is one part of Congressa, that's being, we figured out ways on how to create the reports so they're systemic, the same type of reports that are being used across the area. And there is the time set up already. The supervision is scheduled at least once a month, the strength quotient. The QA meetings are happening on a monthly basis. The administrative meetings are happening bi-monthly and the board meetings. So that we know that the data is being reviewed and integrated and it's being evaluated on a constant basis. So that is um, how we use data to strategize. The other part that, that Wendy mentioned too is thinking about tweaks to the model too. And I think that 
our model has been a lot more successful and we've got a lot more buy-in because of the open feedback that we have. We figured out that we have, uh, the more feedback we can get and if we have open channels, we'll be able to improve our model significant. We've tried things as anonymous surveys. They've been great. Staff like to, to comment where they know there's no consequences. Uh, just saying what tools are most useful, which ones are not useful, are not really being, uh, for example, what, uh, we had a long assessment. How does this really help you for during practice? How much are you referring to it? We figured out it wasn't getting as much use as it should. So we figured out we, we modified and designed it to something that was really going to impact and was going to influence their service delivery. Um, we've used focus groups. Uh, we have regular meetings as well. Even during training as well, I think new staff are, are a great source of feedback to just say like this doesn't make sense or if they identify a gap on the logic model, or even just the manuals and how to use ETO. Somebody who has never seen ETO, they'll be the first one to identify how the manuals are not clear. So we've continued to improve our models, our, our training manuals, as well as the different tools that we're assessing by having open feedback. And I think that kind of covers those two points. So uh, just a couple minutes, we're going to um, do another Zoom in, Zoom out. Um, you can take minutes or Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, when you say you have buy-in, you mean buy-in from the staff? Correct. Buy yeah, buy-in. Yeah, because uh, I think when, when the staff realize that their feedback is important and that they, uh, uh, especially when we do this, uh, for example, this progress check, we had, it was cross-sectional as well. That when we designed it, we had VP supervisors, excuse managers, like what's important, and we start reviewing it, what's the best way of designing this form. When they saw they, they really had an impact on the design and what was the play and how it's supposed to be used, then they become the first people to present it to their, to their other coworkers as well and to, to pilot it out. They were the most <coughs> excited to start and initiate this. It sounds great, but huge. What percentage of the total budget is dedicated towards the data management and the <laughs> no, it's, the data team is about 3%. And, and the thing is, uh, I know a lot of these initiatives too, we try to use different people. I mean, we have definitely a large agency. We have around 60 case managers. So for some meetings, it's not all the case managers meet together to assess. There might be two or three case managers, two or, or five, uh, two or three supervisors when we have 10, 15 supervisors. Uh, and by just staggering it and different people focusing in different areas and also having those meetings open that if somebody wants to join one of the groups, they can do that. Um, we had a significant involvement of certain vice presidents, certain managers that have been there since the beginning. There's right, there's a lot of time that's been put into it and, you know, and our hope is that we'll find ways to incentivize um, some staff to do training down the road because one trainer isn't enough and, and so we're, but that's all, you know, a bigger thing to figure out financial resources. 23. Um, no, sorry, it's actually budget. Converse budget is 23 million. Budget, yeah, our budget without the charge school is about 17 million this year. So we've decreased a little bit in these hard times. Just to uh, follow up on your good questions, uh, a rule of thumb to everybody here in the room, would you say to become a, uh, an agency that actually does data collection data analysis? Uh, they would do using the data, it's maybe 5% of your budget? Is it just a rule of thumb, or is that the difference? I'm not, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what people think. I think there's something different. Uh, when I usually talk to people, I think that when you're starting out, it's around 2%, and you want to ramp up to the point where it's about 3 and maybe a little bit more than 3%. Okay. I think we're, we're at 3% right now. Congress is at 3%. If you're at 3%, it's probably a good reflection of whatever it needs to be for the size of the organization. But you're not going to start out at 3%. I mean, we, we started out with one person, me, and it was less than 1%. And right. you kind of ramp it up over time. Um, you know, I, I'm interested in seeing you know, how, many, how, how many people you had at the beginning when you started. It was probably one or two people. And then yeah. you added people over time. Yeah, we had one, uh, one full-time game manager that um, I supported. And then uh, through the business plan, we were able to add one coordinator, so then we have two full-time staff and a data entry person. And then a couple of years into it, we made a case for an additional uh, data staff. So Juan's the data director, he supervises the training coordinator, uh, who we say was responsible for what kind of goes into the system, right? She does one-on-one -on -one trainings, group training. She's our internal help desk. 
Maria Lee, she's here actually, not in this room, but she's at the conference. And then Andrew is our reporting coordinator, and we say he's responsible for what comes out of the system. Not meaning we don't deliver every report to staff. Staff run their reports, but he's our reports guy. He's our results expert. He's the one that is um, you know, doing any kind of special reports we need. Uh, he's consistently running reports on um, compliance, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and we actually, you know, someone else don't, don't have a data entry specialist anymore. We had hired a data entry specialist at the time when we rolled out the PCM model because there was a lot of duplicate data entry, right? We've had, at one point, 13 external <coughs> databases to deal with in addition to ETO. And so there's a few less now just because, we've, you know, there's been some funding changes, not many. Um, and so, uh, you know, speaking like with, with David and looking at it, like there are a couple ways we can do it, right? You either have everybody to do duplicate data entry, you get the funders to um, agree to let, you know, to use only your system, which didn't really happen, or you, you know, get, you know, a team of data entry specialists and we would, every once a week, each division would get this person for a whole day and they would fill in the data entry. We were careful to say, don't let this person go in and do the PCM data, because we wanted the staff to actually reflect on the values, but this person could do anything else. So that's how we handled um, that. One more question, uh, one more thought about uh, how to use the budget uh, to pr promote data management. Um, I, I knew from the beginning uh, that there's no way that I, keep, that I can drive the entire evaluation at the agency. Uh, I can't be aware of what's happening at all levels. I can be in charge of quality of our data system. Um, the only way that Congress can really do it successfully is if everybody's playing a role at it. Uh, so my thought is like, oh, how can I most leverage everybody's efforts into this? And I figured out that for example, staff cannot be working, spending time on designing a report. So if I design a very good, efficient report like this one, it would save a lot of time for supervisors and having to go into the effort screen, go to the assessment screen, go to the uh, program history screen to start to collect all those variables and put them together. But having them all in the same place is a very efficient way where they can, they can do just review everything and then they can do better the job of program fidelity, implementation, analysis, and, and quick reaction to data, live reaction to data. Um, so that's one way that we figured out what reports and tools they can use so they can monitor the quality and everything. And so that, and that doesn't really come into us to the budget. The only budget is really the designing of the reports. The other thing too, well, I guess, is that type of using volunteers too, people that are, are really enjoyed of, uh, enjoy using the data, the superstars. Um, to be part of this committees as well, and they can promote different initiatives. And everybody who is in the PCM implementation team and all the focus groups and the surveys, our staff is doing the, balancing this, I guess, or juggling with their other responsibilities as well. It's only the data team that's kind of supported. And then to answer your question, Isaac, this was something that I know we had hard conversations with during the whole theory of change process with David, where you had said, you're going to lose folks in this process. And at one point, um, I want to say a couple years ago, we looked into the turnover of case managers. And I want to say the number was about, we had retained about 60, 65% of the case managers, we lost about 40. Now, I think that the average time frame we have a case manager often might be two to five years in some cases, and programs change over. So we, you know, what was attributed to what, I'm not quite sure, but I was happy, I was pleasantly surprised to say we retained a core group. But we also, were, to a degree, say, you know, if, if you're not buying into this, if this is too much, you're part of the old guard. I mean, we had, we had a lot of pushback from staff in different programming um, that said, I, I don't want to talk about these outcomes, education, employment, like I do HIV work, or I do, actually the HIV staff embraced it amazingly. They use data amazingly. We had folks in the maternal child health program just said, I'm about getting this mom to learn about breastfeeding and she's going to take care of her kid. I'm not about to go you know, help her do a resume. And so we had a lot of pushback. And these were long-time case managers. So we've you know, we've had an uphill battle in that way. From a leadership perspective, we've had a lot of consistency. There's been very little turnover in that respect. And I think folks that are involved in the team have sort of stayed constant as well. So I'd be interested to run the numbers again now. We have to keep keeping an eye on it. Uh, going back to the budget question, uh, does that include uh, the time of the superstars and the uh, manager? No. Yeah, that would be. Um, salaries of Juan's team, yeah, my salary ETO. Um, but no yeah. user fees to ETO. That doesn't include the fees. Either. No, it doesn't. It wouldn't include that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's what. Yeah. It just seems to me that this hinges on the right amount of investment. Absolutely. Because underinvestment can cause it. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So there needs. Yeah. 
we talk to folks a lot that are sort of thinking about a system or have gotten, you know, or started an ETO. And, and one of the first questions, you know, I always ask is what staff do you have committed to it? You need at least one de dedicated person that gets to really know that system. It can be a part timer, it can be a full timer, it can be a consultant. But unless you have somebody that is going to drive that system, you know, that's the key. And the other piece, obviously, is leadership. I know as a um, workshop later this afternoon, we'll talk about getting sort of management culture leadership buy in. But it's, it's that investment also is leadership, like buying into it. You know, we've been fortunate. We've had a champion on our board that's been talking about outcomes for a million years. And we get so excited at the board meetings about this. And there has been a shift, I mean, around, you know, we just, um, we're just going to be opening up a federally qualified health clinic. And the first question one board member asked a businessman said, what outcomes are there and how are you going to make sure they happen? I mean, I was, this is great, you know. So but that's been, you know, years coming. Responding to the underfunding thing, um, I can say Congress has gone through a huge shift in the last two years. I know since we implemented AT, we're always focusing on the compliance and the quality, and we made sure that we had a lot of data in the system, but there wasn't too much performance management. Part of the reason wasn't because the staff were resistant to it, but really because it was cumbersome getting to the data. So when I said it's like we well, need to focus on intentional times and settings to discuss data, but also making sure that it's not a job just to get a data. Data should be just readily available. So it was about two years ago when we, we, uh, we were able to add a reporting coordinator who specialized just in doing the reports. And so the hard job of quantifying and aggregating that was happening, that automatically made a huge shift of people start using data when they could just go to the homepage, click on the link, and automatically they have this full report that has everything that's going on. And it makes it much more joyful even for the staff to see what's happening. So I think that was a great strategic decision that Congress was able to push forward. Well, that's because Juan said at one point to me, listen, we could focus on compliance till forever, but at some point we have to start looking at quality. And that's really when we sort of shifted. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. And I just want to, I just want to, under uh, score that I think it's a little bit of the crap in crap out stuff and so I think yeah. that and building the culture you know but but we've seen a lot at PPP we've seen a lot of programs that are beginning the systems or are beginning to do data collection and if it's not meaningful and relevant and accessible to the line staff it really isn't going to improve and, and and I and so I think that's really important I also my experience would indicate to me that the re, that the real cost is a little bit higher, I would say between five and eight percent, honest. That's what I think. Right, you'll count on the in kind sort of time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, if not more. Absolutely. Yeah, I would recommend again the case managers gonna be brought in. Um, so so some of them probably have very different habits. A lot of them are not used to data entry. Uh, you also have some technical uh, proficiency issues. Um, so somebody would not be able to do a timely case though because they're still navigating with two fingers. So um, what 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 is your what is your experience here with that type of change with that kind of capacity development? Uh, so I, I, are you basically retaining the people that can already do it, or did you do something to bring everybody up to that level to be able to do it in a way? It's a good. Done? No, that's a good question. Our VP of training has said. Um, nobody comes to Congress to do data entry, right? And case managers don't take the job to do data entry. <laughs> but we've been really careful um, and, and jumped in one. We've worked in um, ETO, um, not proficiency, but um, the fact that you have to enter data ETO, ETO into job descriptions. So it's something we talk about now really on the recruitment end, front end, and it's in your job description as an additional responsibility. So that was a piece of change in the culture. Um, you know, we've offered some, we found that our training coordinator, you know, and, and when Juan was a one-man show for a short time too, you know, does spend time on um, basic user issues, right, like computer issues, you know, as far as they don't know how to navigate Excel or they don't know how to navigate Word. So our agency's been trying to offer more of that training from our IT department, but resources are so limited. How else would you say yeah, I mean, I, just talking about that example, I remember one of the staff, we have the issue of having multiple databases. You probably yeah. can relate to that. Uh, and it was during one of the support visits I was doing that I saw the staff was retyping the entire case load or case note again, which is like two or three paragraphs. It's like, you know, you just click this two buttons right here, or copy and paste it, and that was like huge saving time. So um, I think it's a very key point just to realize that not everybody's in the same lane and that we need to make sure that everybody has the basics um, and getting there. Reducing resistance too, I guess, is being key by just having the feedback. 
Uh, once people see that, they have their saying that this assessment is too long, it's cumbersome, and we re took a really depth look into our assessments and this is really key to our model. If we stop using this assessment, would that impact the outcomes? Do we really expect the assessment to be yielding to the outcomes? And if not, what part's not? And then we realized that we could modify it and we made it a lot more efficient. It does a much better job of contributing, yielding to the outcomes, much better aligned, and at the same time the staff uh, they spend more less time and uh, have a much more high buy-in with it. So yeah, we've done things too, like ETO user of the month, that so you know folks can nominate yeah, somebody to be recognized <coughs> in that way. But we also, I know we spent a lot of time like going to departments or specific programs and having meetings. So there was a lot of assistance from you know like our truancy staff and from this internal child health staff. And so I mean, I remember spending you know hours with these teams, sort of really listening to them, right? As like the whole management by walking around concept, and it was kind of like. Tell us what's not working for you. And in some cases, the resistance was something that we could easily address, right? Or they misunderstood the model. It was like, I don't expect you to go do the resume. That's not what this means, that you're working extra hours and handwriting this resume for this client. That's not what this is about. So there was different issues specific, so we were careful to kind of address them individually. And believe me, there's still a couple programs that will roll our eyes. You know, when things come up, because we know that it's an uphill battle. But we've also tried to work closely with those supervisors. So we've kind of addressed it kind of one by one, and then there's, you know, there's programs that have unique issues because they do have a really intensive sort of requirement from the funder. So we've eased up certain, we've made exceptions for certain programs to say, just do this piece of it. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have to do this part of the model when it comes to the data entry, and we've taken that out. And that isn't just, you know, in the interest of sort of um, sanity of staff, but there have been really clear reasons why. It's not just because they didn't want to do it. So does that answer your question for someone? Anything else? We probably have time for like one more question. One more question. Yes. Uh, Wendy, and I have a question for you. You open up with the uh, national impact. Can you define what is impact in, the, in, in your world? Yeah. So what I mean, what I mean by impact is when you uh, are able to prove that the program that you are implementing causes changes in the lives. <coughs> of the participants. <coughs> when you're just measuring outcomes, which is very important, that's a whole point of what we were saying today, very, very important. You can't prove that the program is what changed their lives. So you have to undergo a more sophisticated kind of evaluation. <coughs> the, the gold standard is random assignment, not always going to work. Um, there's other methods as well. Um, and so, so that's what I mean. But I think you know, our sense of this, of the social policy field right now is that there's a lot of emphasis on scaling and replication. There's a lot of emphasis on evidence-based practices, and that's not bad, but but the emphasis on that and, and asking for too much from programs too soon squ squashes or quashes um, innovation and also doesn't, I think, recognize the value of you know, shorter term or um, light touch programs, excuse me, <laughs> like the HIV testing program, um, which has, you know, could likely have these kinds of impacts, but aren't necessarily the kind of program that's going to undergo some big uh, random assignment study. So, so um, in closing, we just we encourage you to be zooming in and zooming out in your own organization. <laughs> that you look at, as you look at high quality programming. You know, you zoom in to really look at that quality, just as you zoom in when you work with a client to understand, you know, what their needs are and ensure that the services match them. And then it's important to zoom out and really get the big picture. That's where data review happens. That's where board discussions happen. That's where leadership discussions happen. And you're constantly refocusing that lens to get the wide angle shot versus the close up. So we encourage you to really take that approach as well in your organization. So thank you, thank you for your time. We did hand out, um, and there's a few left up here, resources. We put together a suggested list of uh, reading resources with a couple of uh, citations in there as well. So feel free to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.